Well, great. I'm going to do just uh, one introductory slide to introduce everyone. So hi, everyone. It is fantastic to see everyone's faces on this wonderful Thursday. Um, I, as Erica mentioned, my name is Marianne Tomasek, and I'm a staff attorney at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation, which is in general just a mouthful, so we usually go by CHILPI, if that's easier to remember. Um, and we are a clinical teaching program at Harvard Law School, um, and second and third year law students can opt to spend a semester or more with us to work on health law and policy projects. Now, over the years, uh, CHILPI has provided analyses um, and some technical assistance regarding community health workers um, for state advocates across the country. And these past few months, we've been working with University of Illinois Cancer Center to explore pathways for uh, a sustainable community health workforce, understanding that um, having that kind of long-term stability will be helpful for folks in Illinois uh, generally as well. And so one of our advanced clinical students, Jessica, um, has been doing some research and um, has been tracking the bill. And so I'll turn it over to Jessica um, to talk more specifically about this act. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Eric and Marianne. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, as, as you know, the Community Health Worker Certification Reimbursement Act um, passed quickly through the House and Senate and was signed by the governor earlier this week. Um, so I will start this presentation by just giving some quick background about the role of community health workers, but then I will focus on House Bill 158 and its implementation. So community health workers are public health workers who help patients, especially those from underserved communities and those with complex or chronic health conditions navigate the healthcare system. Community health workers provide a variety of services, including assisting patients in finding health care providers, conducting home visits and educating patients about chronic health conditions and preventive services, and connecting patients with non-medical social services. CHWs allow patients to overcome barriers to care, such as lack of access to health care and distrust or difficulty communicating with clinicians. CHWs have therefore been shown to um, help improve health outcomes for patients as well as reducing health care costs. For example, a Maryland study showed that community health workers, um, a community health worker outreach program to Medicaid beneficiaries with diabetes resulted in an improved quality of life for patients, as well as an average savings of over $2,000 per patient due to reductions in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and Medicaid reimbursements. So the incorporation of community health workers into Medicaid's, um, Illinois' Medicaid program, which serves over 3 million individuals, has the opportunity to really improve healthcare outcomes for residents and dramatically reduce the state's healthcare costs. As you know, Erica mentioned, the um, opportunity to integrate community health workers into Illinois' healthcare system and sustainably fund community healthcare um, services through Medicaid it, it's, is a really exciting opportunity for the state. The bill was introduced by the Illinois Black Caucus to improve the health outcomes of Black residents. The Black Caucus recognized the role that community health workers can have in lessening health disparities through patient education and chronic disease management. Um, and so they included this DHW Certification and Reimbursement Act as part of this bill. In this presentation, I will briefly discuss the major provisions of the bill and will highlight the many decisions that the state and other stakeholders will have to make while implementing the bill. For each decision, I will emphasize the important considerations that should be in our minds throughout the implementation process so that the act can reach its full potential. I'll start by discussing community health worker training. So the act calls for the availability of multi-tiered academic and community-based training programs. The Illinois Department of Public Health in conjunction with state education boards and ILTWA will develop protocol to certify these trainings. While training programs will help standardize and legitimize the profession, training requirements can create a barrier to entry of the field if they're not designed inclusively and accessibly. Since it is so essential that community health workers have an intimate understanding of the communities they serve, we propose the goal of ensuring that community health worker training programs develop core competencies and skills while supporting a diverse workforce that reflects the makeup of communities served. 
both in terms of race, gender, and socioeconomic status, but also in terms of disability and chronic health conditions. Keeping that goal in mind, I'll turn to some of the decisions that will have to be made regarding CHW trainings. One major consideration is cost. Illinois may consider putting a cap on the amount of that training programs can charge, or they can sponsor trainings themselves. New Mexico, for example, provides some free online trainings that are designed and managed by a nonprofit organization. Another major consideration is ensuring that trainings are not too long and that they are offered in a flexible manner that allow those with jobs, childcare responsibilities, or certain health conditions to participate. Some states have standardized hour requirements for trainings and some do not. Um, Texas, for instance, requires that all trainings be 160 hours long with 20 hours focused on each core competency. Massachusetts is much more flexible in certifying trainings of different lengths. However, Massachusetts may be less strict about training lengths because certification is only voluntary for Medicaid reimbursement. Training should also be available in different languages and throughout the state in order to be as inclusive as possible. Online trainings are a good way to ensure that trainings are available even in rural and remote parts of the state. Finally, and importantly, training should be designed with CHWs with disabilities and chronic health conditions in mind. Pre-recorded trainings that can be accessed at any time can allow trainees to work around their own schedules. Now I will move on um, to talk about community health worker certification. The act calls for the development of community health worker of a community health worker certification board to develop and oversee certifications for training programs and individual community health workers. Individual community health workers will be required to be certified in order for Medicaid to reimburse their services. Like with trainings, we have proposed a goal of developing certification requirements that ensure a qualified workforce, but to not create a barrier of entry to the profession. With that goal in mind, we can think about what certification requirements should ideally look like. The board will have to set individual community health worker requirements. Some states require a combination of work experience and training. For instance, Massachusetts requires 2,000 hours of work plus a training and others require only the completion of a certified training such as Texas. The board will similarly need to determine how to certify community health workers who are already working in their communities. Um, some states have more restrictive requirements than others. In developing these grandparent requirements, the state should think about pathways for new public health workers who have just entered the workforce to support vaccination or education efforts around COVID-19 pandemic to become community health workers. And similarly ensure that these requirements are not too onerous that they would exclude certain community health workers from certification. One important decision to make um, regarding individual CHW certification is whether Illinois will consider a candidate's criminal history as a factor in whether or not they can become a certified CHW. The disqualification of CHWs based on criminal legal system involvement can create a significant barrier of entry to the field. In a recent Louisiana study, community health workers and CHW employers emphasized that people who were formerly incarcerated or had a criminal history, but who had gotten back on a good path, often reflect the makeup of community served and can bring valuable life experience to this role. A few states such as Massachusetts and New Mexico require community health workers to submit their criminal history in order to certify, and others like Texas do not. If Illinois feels strongly about including a criminal background check in the CHW certification process, it should set clear, transparent guidelines about how criminal history will be considered. Massachusetts, for instance, only considers convictions or open cases, not arrests or juvenile offenses, and does not automatically disqualify any CHW because of criminal history. They strongly consider mitigating factors and evidence in rehabil of rehabilitation in making their decisions. Now I'll move on to one of the most important parts of the act, the opportunity for community health worker services to be reimbursed through Medicaid. The Department of Healthcare and Family Services will have to develop a list of community health worker services that will be provided by, uh, reimbursed by Medicaid. 
Our proposed goal is for Medicaid reimbursement to be available for a wide range of community health worker services that provide CHW's flexibility to adapt to the needs of the communities they serve. Oregon can be used as a guide for Illinois in developing this list of reimbursable services. Oregon's billing codes cover a broad range of services, including preventative medicine counseling, home visits, substance abuse screenings, patient education and trainings, certain therapies, and oral medication administration. Oregon's billing codes do not cover um, a few of the essential CHW services identified, however, including blood and other laboratory testing and patient transportation. So this might be an area for, for research to see if other states reimburse for these services or if attempts have been made to include these services on billing codes. Oregon though um, is a great example that um, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services have approved pretty wide ranging um, billing codes for CHW services. And now I'll move on to another important aspect of reimbursement, which is supervision. The act requires that CHWs be supervised by an enrolled medical program provider in order for services to be reimbursed by Medicaid. The supervision requirement can enhance the quality of CHW services, but also may create a barrier for reimbursement. Our proposed goal is to strike a balance and ensure that the supervision requirements promote the provision of quality services and the integration of CHWs into the healthcare system without restricting the provision of CHW services. HFS will likely have to define enrolled medical program provider um, in implementing this bill. While most states that require CHWs to be supervised require that supervisors be licensed medical professionals, the language in the Illinois bill is quite vague. The language used in the act reflects that, um, does not reflect that a supervisor must necessarily be a doctor or a nurse. HFS has the discretion, for instance, to develop a tiered approach where specially trained CHW supervisors can supervise fellow CHWs for the purposes of reimbursement. HFS will also have to determine the level of supervision required for CHW services to be reimbursed. Requiring supervisors to be physically present, for instance, may create an obstacle for reimbursement, particularly for services like home visits. Now, finally, I will talk about integrating community health workers into Medicaid managed care plans. HFS will also have to amend managed care organization contracts to allow them to employ or subcontract with community health workers. Certification and supervision is required for CHW reimbursement by Medicaid, but MCOs have the discretion to hire or contract with CHWs who are not certified if they use their own funding to pay for the services. Since the large majority of Medicaid beneficiaries receive services through managed care plans, our proposed goal is to encourage MCOs to utilize CHWs. HFS must decide on which terms of, on the terms of uh, amended CHW, um, sorry, HFS must decide what the terms of uh, new managed care organization contracts will look like. The agency can include language that encourages MCOs to utilize CHWs without mandating their use. Massachusetts, for instance, includes language that encourages health plans to spend startup and ongoing grant funding on investments in the primary care workforce, including hiring community health workers. While MCOs can employ CHWs directly, that would raise issues around patient trust, and questions about whether CHWs are truly serving patients for, from communities that they are intimately familiar with. Community-based organizations and clinics will want to establish agreements with managed care organizations so that they can hire community health workers and be reimbursed for their services. New Mexico um, is an example of this, where some managed care organizations have per member per month agreements with clinics that employ community health workers to provide services for beneficiaries. So in sum, House Bill 158 is an exciting opportunity to integrate community health workers into the Illinois healthcare system and provide sustainable funding for community health worker services through Medicaid. The Department of Public Health and the Department of Healthcare and Family Services will both have to develop rules and processes to implement the act. Stakeholders will have room to try to influence these decisions so that the act um, is implemented in the best way possible. This presentation has outlined many of the next steps in implementation. 
One additional note um, is that there may be an opportunity for the state to apply for newly available funding through the American Rescue Plan Act. The, this COVID relief uh, act made over $7 billion available for um, HHS to distribute to state and local public health departments to support the development of the public health workforce, which includes recruiting, hiring, and training community health workers. While this funding would have to be linked to COVID-19 relief, the development of training programs for community health workers, for instance, to support uh, pandemic education or vac vaccine efforts will inevitably contribute to a stronger community health worker infrastructure generally. So thank you all for listening and I think we will get to questions now. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. I think um, there, was, there were a couple of questions in the chat box, so we'll just quickly go through. Um, but the slides will be available um, after the presentation, so we'll make sure that everyone receives them. And then we had a question from um, Elizabeth. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. I just wondered if there was any discussion or direction about how the certification board will be formed or timelines around when to expect that. I haven't read the bill yet, so. Yeah, I mean, the from what I read in the bill, and if anyone else um, in, the, in the audience knows anything additional, please let us know. But there wasn't a strict timeline, or um, I know that in previous bills, there has been like a timeline of like in 12 months, we will do something. For this one, there wasn't a specific timeline on when the Illinois Department of Public Health will get the board together, um, but they did have a very specific, they had some language saying that they'll work with the association, so the Illinois CHW Association. I mean, I think we have some representatives here from that, but I know that part of the, part of the sort of agreements and discussions were that the board is going to work with the Illinois State um, CHW Association. So timeline, I did not see anything in the bill as in previous bills. And, um, but I do know and from the bill that the Department of Public Health will work with the Illinois CHW Association. Yes, Letitia, go ahead. You can definitely speak. Um, well, um, first of all, thank you, Erica, and your, your team for putting this together, and you are absolutely right. Perfect timing on this. Um, we had the pleasure of being a part of that signing, and I am Letitia Bouton Price with the Illinois CHW Association, and what an exciting time for us at this moment. So at the association, we are definitely in close communication with HFS as well as the Department of Public Health regarding the implementation of this bill. We have set up an opportunity for to get feedback from individuals. So a lot of the questions that you all are asking at this time, we just don't have the answers to. Um, but the work group that we have set up through ILTWA, the certification and reimbursement work, group, we are using that um, committee to kind of help guide and provide, give people an opportunity to provide feedback so that we can share that information with IDPH as well as um, HFS, who uh, participates in those committee meetings. So if you have interest, and we would love to get as much feedback as possible, you are welcome to join our meetings um, on the fourth Friday of the month, starting at 11 a.m., which uh, we have a meeting tomorrow. And I did ask if we could get the presenters. Uh, I know this is like short notice and things of that sort, but this presentation is so perfect. Um, that we would love to have you guys present tomorrow if you have time at 11 a.m. If not, then we'll just share the recording once it becomes available. But again, um, there is no timeline right now. And a lot of the information was kept broad in general because in our um, discussion around this crafting the language for this, they encouraged us to be as broad as possible because the more we, you know, kind of pinpoint things, the harder is to 
change things later on down the line. So I do apologize for the generalness of this and the broadness of it, but that was the advice of IDPH as well as HFS to kind of keep it as broad as possible. And as was mentioned in the presentation, through rules, through other processes, then things get a little bit more defined. So once again, we welcome you to participate in our committee meetings. And um, I will, I think um, I can share my email address in the chat. And if you have an interest and most of you on this webinar are part of that process anyway, we would welcome your feedback. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Leticia. Um, that was really helpful. There is another question. I think this is um, this is great too. From I don't know if Miss O'Day wants to just ask the question about um, oral health and CHWs. Hi, thank you so much. Yes, uh, Layla O'Day with the Oral Health Forum, and I just wanted to know uh, what conversations, if any, have been had about including. Um, this reimbursement with the, with oral health and uh, dental providers. We currently at OHF have worked um, uh, very closely in the last several years with trying to implement um, a CHW oral health kind of uh, model. And so I'm curious to see what kind of conversations have been had with that. Thank you. And I think no, I, and I think this is sort of timely as well because if we don't have people that are representing different organizations, then we're not going to bring be able to bring this up, right? So now Letitia has heard, and there there are a number of people here um, from the Illinois Department of Public Health as well. So I think now oral health, you know, definitely is something that we want to make sure that if any of us are at the conversation, we can say, hey, what about oral health? I think that's how the criminal background came up. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica was like, hey, what about this? And, you know, so I think it's through being able to have these conversations that we can make it a lot stronger. Yeah, um, so and if I may interject here, we, hi, Layla, we are working with the oral health department uh, within IDPH, and we are definitely, um, trying to be as inclusive of all community health workers in, you know, that focus in on the social determinants of health, oral health, um, all chronic diseases, all illnesses, all things that affect the communities that we come from and that we serve. We are bringing all of that to the table. In regards to the background checks, I mean, we, ILCHWA, which was formerly the Chicago Community Health Workers Local Network, has been at this work for decades. And we have done numerous surveys, forums, you know, um, in, in communication uh, with our membership, as well as different tables that we sit at to ensure that we're being as inclusive as possible to make sure that we're capturing the voices, the concerns, the successes, the everything related to the community health worker workforce. So um, yes, we are definitely looking to do that. But regarding background checks, our stance on that is, you know, it, we're going to definitely ensure that no one is left out of the process because of their backgrounds, but a lot of that will depend on those individual employers because a hospital hiring a person has a different, you know, liability concern than a community-based organization. So we definitely want to emphasize the differences in that and really, you know, understand that even though a person has a criminal background, that does not define who they are. People do learn and grow in different circumstances um, you know, promoted different, different actions for them. And so we, so you know, we do understand that and we do plan to make sure that there are not as many barriers 
in place or we can eliminate as many barriers so that everyone who desires to be a community health worker can work in that field without um, prejudices based on their background. So I hope that helps. But I, I promise you that, you know, Ilchwa, you know, being named in this legislation, a group that is representative of uh, members across the state of Illinois, we, we invite you to participate in our committees. We have you know, certification financing, we have workforce development, um, and we're looking at all of these things. So there is a space for you to, you know, offer your thoughts, your suggestions, your concerns, your um, advice, you know, what's working, what's not working. So there is a space for you all to contribute. So please, I am just encouraging you to um, join us. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Letitia. Um, so another question came in from Jeanette. Um, do you want to go ahead, Jeanette? Can you hear me? Yes, great. So I saw the um, Oregon reimbursable CHW um, services and was wondering if Illinois is going to model that same reimbursement schedule. And if so, will um, patient transportation, will we attempt to get that reimbursed as well? Because I know that's a big part of what a lot of CHWs do is to help um, community members get to appointments. Yeah, I think, you know, with everything and what Letitia said, this will be something that we'll make sure to share in terms of like patient transportation is really important for community health workers. And like, what does that mean? Is it the act of the paying for the transportation or is it the CHW helping the patient get the transportation. So I think this is where, you know, we can definitely provide information, um, which is why it's really, it's great to be able to look at the way that other states are doing it and what works for Illinois and what doesn't. Also, can I quickly add on one other question <laughs> while I'm at it? Um, the other question is, I know that um, when you mentioned enrolled medical provider, that those were, that would be the person supervising the CHWs. And I know um, that, Leticia, you mentioned um, CBOs also working with CHWs who might not have a natural clinical um, staff person. It looks like from what I'm hearing that you would consider other type of knowledge or background for someone to be an enrolled um, um, medical provider. Is that correct? Yes, and we're also considering third party billing, like the, because we understand that the Medicaid billing process is just monstrous. And even current medical billable providers don't understand the system and not really getting out of the system all that they can because that process is so confusing. And so we in, in, in sharing that information with HFS, they have shared that they are looking to redo that process and kind of simplify that process. But people that are not able to access and become medical Medicaid billable providers, then they are also working, we're also trying to figure out ways that a, your community-based organization can access that system by not being identified as a Medicaid billable provider. So yes, we are talking about all of, all of those things. That's great, thanks. And um, Margie just mentioned that, Margie, do you wanna add anything else? But um, you just mentioned that there were, you know, getting rules through the system is really challenging and takes time. Um, so I think it is definitely really important to rely on organizations and I mean, especially sort of I like health and medicine, um, but if you wanted to share a little bit more about that, that'd be great. Sure, I'll just say, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call have experience with this. Um, Margie Schatz from Health and Medicine Policy Research Group, and uh, we've been engaged in this for a long, long time as well. And uh, getting a bill passed is monumental. It, it, it is like it, it's a huge endeavor, and congratulations to everybody for that. Um, but then, my our experience is that. That's just the beginning in some ways that we, we have been, uh, our freestanding birth center legislation that we passed many years ago, it took five years to get the rules and regulations written. Now, I think we are in a different time right now. And I think this post COVID period and the attention on community health workers might speed things up. But 
I can't emphasize from our experience the important, I can't emphasize enough the, the importance of advocacy and everybody being in there saying, we got to do this now, it, not letting up on HFS and IDPH on getting these rules and regs written so that we can actually move ahead. Thanks, Margie. That's, I think that's one of the reasons that we really wanted to just look at this from an implementation perspective, because we started talking about this like when they were working on it was because it's great and it is, you know, it's a great achievement and celebration, but it's like all the rules. I mean, the bill is 161 pages and this little article is like three pages. So it's just like, there's so much um, opportunity, but I think, especially for everyone who's been doing it for so long, maybe some organizations have figured it out for themselves and it works for them, but that doesn't mean that everyone else has. And how do we actually help the other organizations that maybe haven't figured it out um, because so many have already. It's great. Eric, I would just add like there's been really fabulous legislation passed this session and, and we're not even done with the, the session. And so each of these big bills is going to require so much effort to, to write the rules and regs and everybody's jockeying to get their piece of it. Uh, get the rules and regs done for their piece. So we got to be in there with them. And, and it sounds like you are, Letitia, that uh, it's fabulous. I just, I, I just know it takes, takes everybody's energy to try and make this happen. Yeah, it does. And it's also important that we kind of speak the same language. I know each of us has our own, you know, area that we want to focus in on. But I think if we, you know, ILTRA is, is a space to kind of help you know, kind of uh, get the get the language together, right? And I know maternal child health, diabetes, oral health will have a different, you know, um, some some type of different language. But there are some common things that we can all be speaking on when we are in those spaces with our different um, with different decision making um, decision makers. So. Um, again, you are right, Margie, uh, and your experience, it's not going to happen overnight, but it is still good to stay in front of these decision makers as often as possible so that things do not fall by the wayside and it just gets put on the shelf as did the 2014 uh, <laughs> recommendations that we're now, you know, trying to to get out and, 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 you know, get them to fruition. So again, all of your help will be needed to make this thing happen. And we just implore you to, you know, get at, get at a space and, and definitely include people that are doing the work um, in these uh, conversations, because ultimately, you know, we are working for, uh, an essential workforce that is long overdue the recognition in this state of Illinois. Um, and it's not a new workforce, like CHWs has been around for ages. And so I think it's just long overdue here in Illinois for community health workers to get the recognition and, you know, those sustainability strategies um, in place so that we can continue to do our, our the work that we do with the living wage um, and, and, you know, continue to help the communities we live in and that we serve. Great. Thanks, Leticia. We do have a couple more questions, so I'll quickly go through them. Um, Vita, do you want to ask your question about the American Rescue Plan? And Jessica, maybe you have an answer for this one. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Jessica and Marianne, for um, doing this presentation. Um, yeah, this is a very simple question. I think it seems like a really great funding opportunity. So I'm just wondering who actually applies for that. Um, is it IDPH or, um, you know, who, who actually applies for that funding? And do we have plans? I don't know if Letitia knows to apply for that. Anyone who knows the answer can jump in. I think that it's the Department of Public Health who would have to apply, but others may know more details. Yeah, I mean, we can definitely um, look into it as well. Yeah, I think I mean, it has to be one of the government um, agencies, but 
we can definitely ask our government relations team as well. So it, even in the process of this, uh, this bill, um, our Congresswoman Robin Kelly, you know, got some money um, to kind of help support some of the activities of this grant. So I don't know where the money went to, but that was something that Representative mm -hmm. Lilly had commented on in one of the hearings um, about this bill. So know, uh, Ms. Vita, that um, the state and other entities, especially Ilchwa, are definitely you know, trying to stay on top of this and follow these dollars because there are specific pots of money designated for community health workers and workforce development. So of course, we're trying to figure out how the state can access that and then it get trickled down to the people that are actually doing the work. So we do have our antennas up on stuff like that and that we are trying to figure out um, you know, how to get access. So as Erica mentioned, we do know that it does go to government entities, but sometimes these get put out in RFP process so that, you know, other organizations can apply as well. So once we figure out a, a streamline or a process, then we can share that information. Um, and I'm as other organizations on this uh, webinar, um, I'm sure will do as well. Yeah, okay. just one more thing to, um, to kind of add to this conversation about um, the number of great laws that have been passed and kind of like the, the timeline that it takes these boards set up and regulations. Um, because the American Rescue Plan Act does include at least, I believe they set aside $32 million for training community health workers. That might be a strategic way to keep this act in the forefront of policymakers' mind because there is this pot of money now available now. And if the certification board does institute some kind of training requirement in order to grandparent CHWs, maybe this is like the stars aligning that this year or next year, there's this pot of money to make it affordable for current CHWs that can be, be used. And, Maybe this kind of timing is just what um, some of the policymakers need um, to, to fight to keep, um, keep the train running on this act. Thank you, Marianne. That's really, really important because I think, I mean, that's part of the challenge with all these bills that they're passed, but then there's no sort of budget line attached in the actual Illinois budget. So it makes it really hard to implement and sort of have your the priority. So that's a really, um, that's a really good point. We did have, um, I think, one other person, um, Ms. Mildred Hunter, if you wanted to sort of say your comment, but she was just talking about how important it is for the role of CHWs to be sustained. Um, if there's anything else you want to add, but we definitely agree. And then I see Dr. Mendenhall has raised her hand. Go ahead, Dr. Mendenhall. Everyone, um, thank you for the wonderful summary. It's um, really good. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking, I'm loving this, right? This community and just trying to think about like, how can we um, really kind of move this forward? So I graduated from the University of Chicago in um, public policy, and I'm actually getting an award there yesterday, tomorrow. And I'm only saying that because I'm, I'm thinking about, right? Like my work, and public policy. And I know before we talked about possibly doing a policy clinic. So I think it would be interesting to do a policy clinic that looks at both HBO 158 and then also the American Rescue Plan and just kind of following as, it's, as it is trying to be implemented and some of the barriers and also having the policymakers there, right? The um, essential workers, like everybody at the table trying to craft what this could look like. So I just wanted to get you all's feedback on what, what do you think about that? And of course I'd have to you know, um, run it by U of I, but I, but I could imagine that their students would love it. The award is the minority students in um, public policy. So I would just assume they would love something like that. I'm hearing some good idea, hopefully, but, but what, do, what do you all think? 
I mean, I, I think it's a great idea. Anytime you can get some resources to focus. Um, I think that's why we're able to get all this great information that Jessica and Marianne put together because they were able to focus and really Mm -hmm. spend some time digging deep, which not a lot of us get time to do when we're working on a lot of other projects. So I think, um, it would be a great idea. And if anyone from the state or anyone from any of the other organizations want to follow BAFTA, that'd be great as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great idea too. Um, I'm always looking for more opportunities to learn more about policy work. And I just think it's the culmination of all the work that we all, all do all the time. And to see these efforts really um, you know, merge into policy and be sustainable is like kind of the pinnacle of what we all aim for. So I think that's a really great idea. Yeah, yeah. And so I was thinking also like policy briefs, um, op-eds, um, kind of budget. Um, Letitia, right, we, we talked about training, um, developing training online for both young people. I'm working with Morehouse College of Medicine on training um, high school students, and then also adults. Um, innovations, we do a make at the College of Medicine and um, what would it mean to get resources to people who are on the ground and facing these challenges, but also have ideas about solutions and getting resources into their hands. So, so Dr. Bidaha, I love this idea and, you know, Ilchwa would love to work with you on trying to figure out how to bring that forth because, mm-hmm. Um, We did have a policy committee and we are definitely trying to figure out how to chronicle this most recent legislative journey. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we would love to, you know, kind of collaborate on that. Great. So, um, and I have students here at the university who are interested. So uh, maybe like in two weeks, I'll try to have a meeting, invite, um, you know, just whoever is willing. And I'm some of you, you all have like many other people here on this list, we can extend it and just maybe set up regular meetings. Even if U of C isn't interested, we can still try to think about how to do something like this. Because so. it's right. important, right? Like my, my, my vision is training like 100,000 community health workers, Morehouse College of Medicine, they believe all young people should be trained as community health workers. So I'm even thinking about, could it possibly be incorporated into schools, right? Where um, young people learn about health and mental wellness, financial um, stability and all that. So just some ideas. That's great, thank you so much. And I think, I don't see any any other questions. Um, we want to be definitely respectful of time. If people want, if anyone else has any comments or feedback, um, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourselves. Um, We are really excited to just, you know, be able to look at how we can implement this and move this forward. Um, I think for us as a cancer center, we use community navigation when we go out and do outreach and engagement for cancer prevention. So it's really close to to all of our work, but also to all the work that we do um, to address health inequities. So I think um, the wonderful thing is everyone here, we don't have to sort of convince anyone that this is important. I think we're way beyond, we're past that. Now it's like, how do we actually um, get it to move to the next step and, and make sure that our organizations have access, not just some that have resources. Um, so I think that that's what's really important. So we just want to thank um, Jessica and Marianne again and their institute for everything that they've done with us. And then if um, anyone else has anything else, but otherwise you'll get a wrap up email from me with the slides and a couple of other questions. Um, Mildred is saying, Ms. Hunter, I highly recommend an op-ed in a peer-reviewed publication to bring national visibility. That's wonderful. Um, so, so I think for now that that's all that's all we have. But want to just thank everyone for your time. And again, Jessica, good luck with finals. She has her finals in her law school, so we're really excited for that. And have a wonderful day. Thank you for putting this together. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.